every again uh, we're going to be talking about Dyson spheres, but obviously more <laughs> more driven towards swarms and bubbles. Um, yeah, the future of energy. Uh, let's get into it. Um, humans and energy, I guess, kind of the origins. Um, uh, Kai, am I talking about this, or are you just sorry, just checking? I I can stop talking about it. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So since the beginning of civilization, humans have always depended on energy, like for heating, for like, we've depended on it for cooking, for until like, now we use it every day, we have electricity, we, we use a lot and a lot and a lot of uh, natural gases and coal and oil, um, which is really harmful for the environment. We have a lot of cl climate warming, um, which is quite harmful and something that we need to take care of soon. Um, as you can see in this infographic, we have um, in 2020, there's 84% of global energy was produced from fossil fuels, um, while renewable energy was ma mainly made up of nuclear and hydropower, um, which made up around 10% of renewable energy, of all energy um, that we have created. Um, so it's really important that we are able to start converting a lot of our fossil fuels and stop using fossil fuels and start, um, using more sustainable forms of energy as, um, such as wind power or hydropower and really nuclear power as well, which is rising as well. Um, so. Dyson spheres, as we were talking about, will introduce a lot of solar power, and I think it's something um, we should talk about. And as we advance as a civilization, there's also um, a lot of things that come with it, like being able to harness all of the energy that, that is on our planet, and that's something that comes with the Kardashev scale that classifies all the different levels of civilizations. Yeah, I think, and yeah, and then up next we have the Kardashev scale, which we have been talking about at the Art of Inquiry in Julia's classes a lot. It's a huge topic that comes up often. Um, so the Kardashev scale really just talks about a civilization's level of harnessing the energy um, on their planet, on their um, on their planet star, how just how they consume and harness energy. Um, so this. The Kardashev scale is really for us to measure other civilizations, other conceptual possible civilizations in our own. Um, so here's just a quick infographic just for understanding. So um, for the Kardashev scale, the Kardashev scale is a, a very conceptual scale. So different scientists, different researchers say different things about it. Um, for now, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be mostly talking about the six types, five types mostly. Um, so there's a type one civilization, which means that it is capable of controlling energy on the scale of its entire planet, the energy of its entire planet. Um, we, uh, a type two is capable of controlling the entire energy of its host star and travel and be able to travel through its entire solar system. Um, a type three, it would be capable of controlling the energy at the scale of its, its entire host galaxy. Type four would be capable of using energy at the scale of the universe, meaning this would be creating galaxies, manipulating space time. Uh, type five um, would be capable of using energy at the scale of the multiverse, travel to parallel universities, universes, and simulate universes. And then type six, again, these like last two, three are not very relevant to us now. We're in the next tens of hundreds of thousands of years, but um, a type six civilization uh, would be a civilization that exists beyond time and space, um, or in higher dimensions, and that be creates and destroys multiverses, which is, again, that is very, very long time for now to even, like, start thinking about how that would even work. Um, okay, so we are currently a 0 0.7 on the scale. We are barely a type one. Um, but in terms of Dyson spheres, a type two civilization can harness the energy of its host star and travel through its solar system. So this could, this more or less means that it is most likely that a type two or higher civilization could build a Dyson sphere and have energy of its, um, host, mm -hmm. host sun, sorry, it's just sun. 
uh, next. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, so may possibly in a few hundred years, um, humanity could become a, a type one civilization. We're already on the right track. We've we quite recently gotten into the atomic age. We started building nuclear reactors. We've harnessed a lot of um, nuclear energy in the past few years. And uh, nuclear energy is a very sustainable source of energy. And as we continue to harness the energy, all the different materials that we have on earth, we can slowly make our way towards becoming a type two civilization. Um, and possibly in millions of years, once we are able to reach that threshold, we might be able to become, uh, we might be able to make a Dyson sphere um, to be able to harness the energy of our star and start um, creating more advanced technologies to be able to start going into deep space and like exploring the rest of the universe. So mm -hmm. as it's written here, the Dyson sphere is a conceptual piece of machinery that scientists one day hope to use to surround the sun and use the sun's solar energy and beam it back to earth so we can use it as well. Um, said machinery will consist of masses of solar panels or say mirrors that will be able to um, transfer solar energy back to its home planet or other, other planets in the solar system. In our case, for now, we would be thinking about Earth, um, but it could potentially be to any planet. Uh, again, this are, these are just, again, um, this is a 3D rendering, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, as I think these would be basically um, orbiting um, panels around the sun. Uh, so this would be a good like million miles in diameter, which is just insane to think about. But yeah, okay. Um, problems. Let's talk about the problems of a Dyson sphere, just how some things don't always go smoothly. One second. Um, basically, what we want to talk about here is that um, a Dyson shell would involve a lot of material. And uh, by involve a lot of material, we mean that we will literally have to mine mercury in order to actually get enough material. And even that's probably not enough because let me, one second, sorry, uh, right here. So the sun is right here, meaning this entire shell is, I'm still not sure if this says meters or miles in thickness. I'm pretty sure it's meters, um, but yeah. Um, it is a lot of material, meaning it is ex almost impossible to make one. It's still, even if we had enough materials, it would take forever to build because it is quite literally extremely large in diameter. Um, so something more possible would be a bubble ring or, um, or a swarm, most likely, um, because these would be just free float, free form, free, sorry, just floating panels around the sun, not in any particular shape, not not connected or organized. Um, okay. Yeah, and if I could add something about the um, issues about a Dyson, Dyson shell. So having a Dyson shell, obviously it's almost impossible to construct. We have to construct a whole shell around the sun and the, being able to transport that huge mass around the sun and be, that would be close to impossible. And even if we were able to do that, say we were, then this Dyson shell will be really um, susceptible to impact where it could just dismantle the whole, the whole thing as it's very thin, or it could shift as well gravitationally and it might fall into the sun, which is a really big um, danger as we would lose millions and millions of, um, kilograms of material. So if we have something like a Dyson bubble or a Dyson swarm, we'd be able to surround the sun, but not in a way that anything, things can still pass through it. And, you know, if you have a Dyson shell, we wouldn't have any sunlight either. So a Dyson swarm would still allow for us to get sunlight. Um, it would also allow for the many millions and millions and millions of satellites uh, to orbit the sun without getting um, in any way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so up next we have how, uh, basically like how we would get there, like just how 
what would it take to build a Dyson Sphere? Uh, basically, these, this is a very nice infographic uh, by Chris Gazat, um, which uh, Chris Gazat talks a lot about STEAM, and actually it's a very good astrobiology resource. Um, so the Dyson Sphere right here, it shows um, a Dyson, I think this would be a Dyson bubble. Um, I once showed this, um, I was doing a workshop on astrobiology, on Dyson Sphere. It's, um, people quoted this, this looked like a Dyson, Dyson donut. Um, so I guess that's what you call this. Um, again, over here, you'd have to mine Mercury. Um, you'd have to launch the satellites that you would make out of the resources found on Mercury. Um, you'd have to refine materials. Sorry, wait, no, mine Mercury, refining the materials, and then launching the satellites from Mercury to um, the sun, uh, especially because Mercury is the closest. Um, uh, the super also... I feel like there has been some talks about would this just end up being like terraforming Mercury, which I highly doubt that's what it is relevant to. Um, so, but it's, I think it's less terraforming where you just at this point just stripping um, Mercury away from its resources from um, metals and rock. Um, so, and then you'll just be launching those solar collectors from, uh, sorry, launching solar collectors. Um, which will collect, sorry, collect energy from solar reflectors, which will, both of them will be surrounded by, surrounded around the sun. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna explain this one, uh, or do you wanna explain it together? Sorry, I just forgot the order. Um, yeah, you, you can explain this for uh, first. Okay, so laws, regulations, and ethics, just because this is a really huge job and that, um, only f if you think about it, only maybe few people will have power over this thing that the earth might depend all of its energy on, meaning essentially one person literally just has the power to make sure no one has energy or everyone has energy. Um, so basically the question is, how could we do this ethically? Um, uh, so just some regulations we could implement. Um, we could set laws and limitations on power usage and personal energy consumption just more or less making sure everyone is being conscious that even though, oh, I'm so sorry, I think that, oh, that cut off, uh, the text is, I am so sorry, the technical difficulties, just ignore that. Um, more or less, we just wanna make sure that everyone's being conscious that even though we have near unlimited energy, we want people to just still know to be conscious and to be aware that it's not unlimited, but, there's still a point because we don't, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we could just destroy the planet just because we think, oh, we have a little bit of energy, we can do whatever we want now. No, that's not the case. Um, we could also, this is a really big point, we could implement oaths for anyone in the energy industry. Obviously, this might not actually physically do anything, but from a philosophical, philosophical <laughs> standpoint, um, being part of building, taking care, of a Dyson Sphere could give, again, as I said earlier, this could give people so much power. Um, essentially, anyone working close to the Dyson Sphere could shut off the entire world for literally everyone. Um, another point I'd like to add, this could also, and we, the, we wanna make sure this doesn't cause any conflict or <laughs> I guess a, a theory could be like an energy wars, um, which I highly doubt will happen. Uh, because I do not know what civilization will look like at that point. Um, hopefully, we'll be a bit more peaceful. Um, okay. Kai, do you want to explain this one? Sure. Um, so there are many things that we can do with um, a Dyson Swarm. Um, so with all this energy, we can really advance our technology. Um, you know, we could control whether easier easier um, global travel can become easier. We don't have to rely so much on fossil fuels. We can use a lot of different kinds of energy as we can innovate in the future. Um, we can use this energy to move to, um, to migrate to other planets in deep space, and we can try terraforming those planets in the future. Um, and one of the major problems that we have right now um, in current day is we have a lot of space junk. Like every time we send up a rocket to space, you have these boosters, you have these main stages, you have these 
all these different rocket parts that are filled with fuel and just fall off the rocket after it reaches some um, uh, high enough orbit. And it just stays in low Earth orbit and it starts creating sort of a net around Earth. And, you know, after a long time, there could be sort of um, a domino effect, say something, a small piece of debris hits a satellite. And if the at orbital speeds, the satellite would definitely explode into many different pieces and it could hit more satellites, effectively taking out the entire, um, a lot of internet and it would take out radio. It would take out a lot and a lot of things that humanity depends on today. And I think being able to use that um, energy and possibly help cleaning up space junk is a really important part of that. Um, you know, I've written a few things about space junk as well, because it is really something that um, I don't really see so much um, often, but, you know, space junk is really a big problem and it could lead to really disastrous effects in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go um, just a uh, conclusion. Uh, we can say this together. Um, a few, uh, actually, I would like to say um, Sasha pointed this out um, while we were discussing our project with um, the entire group, um, everyone, everyone at our of inquiry. Um, nuclear, so we were talking about like nuclear power and how just in general, how like obviously right now we don't see a Dyson swarm at our sun and just in general we probably won't see a Dyson shell for a very long time actually never um uh because it is near impossible we're probably going to do a swarm as I said before um but the point is it's a very long time from now and until then we have to figure out how because we definitely have we we might not have the resources to fix climate change, but we definitely have the ideas and the cap capability to we, we just have to kind of implement them. I don't is there anything we have to add? Thank you so much. This yeah. is wonderful. I, I really loved how you tied together the space science, the concern about our planet the ethics, the future of the humanity. Yeah. I, I, I think this is uh, what we lack sometimes when we talk about science. So, as some, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, as someone very interested in science policy and um, in like science communications and science education, I think it's really interesting to not only understand, you know, like a core science, obviously, but to, you know, also, also know um philosophical concepts of it and understanding um like scientific outreach um and, and stem education which i'm personally very interested in studying so yeah yeah um like i like we mentioned before you know making these really fantastical kinds of um technologies these really far in the future it really comes with a lot of things um, that are really important. We we wouldn't want any kind of conflicts about, you know, energy. And if we have too much power concentrated in one place, we could have many um, dangerous events that it could occur. There could be political um, wars that occur out of this um, energy that we get from the Dyson swarms. And I think it's really important that we make sure, um, you know, like Sasha, Sasha said, space is for everyone. Um, and we shouldn't let um, our future fall into the hands of things um, like politics. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly, again, I already said this beginning, um, I still want to uh, thank my partner who, again, she can be here today, Shyla. She was such a huge help to this project. She was a wonderful partner. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to give a lot of credit to her. She is amazing. And her research was really nice. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Clap, clap, clap. I don't know if this will go through the microphone, but clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Any questions for Dina and Kai? Sure. I'll jump in for a quick minute. Um, one that was wonderful. Um, I love 
talking about mega structures and looking for them astronomically. Um, it is fun to look back at Dyson's paper that he originally wrote. It's one page that he wrote, and he has what we in the science is called back of the envelope thinking. Um, it's basically what we call a thought experiment. Um, and so the reason for that, that, that three meter thickness for the shell originally is that that's the mass of Jupiter at twice the distance from Earth from our sun um, distributed over a shell. And what Dyson was arguing is that we could actually look for Dyson spheres by looking for infrared light, which is what J JWST is looking at. Um, so maybe JWST will see some little infrared dots that are actually Dyson spheres out there, um, which is pretty cool. But I, I agree, like the swarms are kind of a cooler idea. Um, have you guys heard of Tabby Star? Um, the, the star that we we, we saw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was actually just doing research right before I right before I joined the meeting. Yeah, I've heard of it. It's the one where um the dimming, right? Where it's uh I'm not sure exactly. It was I didn't I only looked at it very vaguely. Yeah, so Tabby Star is pretty cool. So now a lot of people are thinking now that the dimming, so so we're looking at this star, we see like the light kind of dimming in and out a little bit. And at first, some people were like, oh my gosh, we just found a Dyson swarm. We just found a mega structure around this star. But you know, in the sciences, we always have to consider alternative hypotheses and what else might be possible. And so a lot of people now think it's a lot of dust obscuring the light from the star, um, but we don't know. And so there's a lot of possibility out there. And so I will say though, I'm, I'm really glad you also then kind of go to the next step of, is it ethical? for us to do this, to trap all of our starlight, to build a swarm, and what happens to humans in that far distant future, but it's still good for us now to prepare ethically for what the future holds. Um, so, so congratulations to both of you on a very excellent presentation. I, I really enjoyed that a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I will step in and say it's, it's truly excellent too. <clears throat> it gives the overall picture. Uh, <clears throat> And overall, I agree with uh, Graham that the idea of looking at the ethics and so on, it's not just about what we can do and why we need to do it, but whether or not we should do it and what the impact will be. We know that everything that we do has some sort of an impact that sometimes we can uh, predict and sometimes we can't. You know, when you build a dam so that you can have more water and grow more food, it's going to have a big impact on things in ways that you don't really know. And we're unfortunately ex uh, experiencing that on a global scale right now. <clears throat> and this may be a solution, it'll come with its own, own problems. I know people in space law, um, and this is an important thing. Uh, it's the, the question about who gets to control this, you know, it's, it is, I mean, one thing is that if we have energy for everybody, it would improve things tremendously, but that just is an opportunity then for somebody to control it and be able to decide who can do what. So that's always something that we have to worry about too. So it's it's really well thought out as far as public outreach and education and so on. That's something that any scientist will tell you is critical because you need support. People need to understand it. And you can see there's so much information about some of the science that's out there. People have a chance to take it and turn it into something else and make everything sound completely different. So that's a really critical component. And, you know, I know people at, at, at LIGO and Virgo and projects all around the world that are doing this outreach because people need to understand what's going on. And they can't get money if they can't get support. You know, people have to know about it. So that, that's a really comprehensive, I think that's really important, my main comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to quickly add, um, so we ended up having to change our presentation. Um, something happened, we realized. Uh, so I just wanna say that was an interesting, I guess, like bump in the road. Um, I would also just wanna just show like our, um, how we ended up making everything. I could send the presentation in the chat later, just so you guys could see our kind of like train of thought. Um, this original, the original presentation um, that I will send was the one Shannon and I uh, made a few months ago. Again, we had to change it, um, but yeah, just wanted to show, yeah. Thanks so much for the feedback. Um, that's a real world example, you know, that you, you write a grant proposal and then everything has to change. I've been on proposals, it's the same thing. 
that that got changed back and forth for five years before it finally got funded in almost its original form. So, you know, that's just the way it goes. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask a question or also bring up a topic. Um, first of all, absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, it's very clear that you did a lot of um, research and that you really thought it out and considered all of the implications um, at a level far deeper, I think, than uh, many other like videos and presentations I've seen on the subject. Um, so first I wanted to ask, are you familiar with the Vasco project or have you heard of it? I don't think so. It sounds really interesting. I think I may have heard a glimpse of it, but I I have no idea. It sounds really interesting though. Yeah, so you should uh, check it out. It's um, basically, it's called uh, Vanishing and Appearing uh, Sources Over Century of Observation. I think that's what the acronym is. And what they're basically doing is they're looking at old uh, photographic plates from the 1960s um, and then looking at modern day all sky surveys. And they're specifically looking for star-like objects that were there in the 60s, but have dimmed to the point where we don't see them anymore. Which of course, you know, on astronomical time scales, like it, that's an insanely short amount of time. So that, that would be like a significant anomaly. Um, and it's pretty cool. They're doing a citizen science thing where uh, people all over the world are looking through these old images and uh, then looking at modern images and seeing if they can find these weird transient sources. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun volunteer science thing you can do if you want to look into it. Um, I also just wanted to ask, uh, you said you were very interested in science policy. Um, from that standpoint, can you think of any policies that you would want to put in place to prevent people from take, taking over the Dyson sphere, let's say? Um, uh, again, um, I think like a space, like, again, like science policy, the vegan, like space law and space, space policy. Um, again, definitely, I really want to elaborate on the oaths because I think oaths are very important for example there's the um i already forgot what it's called i'm so sorry um where it's an oath for doctors um and i remember there's only very few doctors who have this specific oath again i forgot the name and it's really important um and, and it's an oath to make sure that you are um, practicing medicine correctly that you're practicing um ethically which i think is extremely important um because, you know, being, for example, again, a doctor, it's a very important job. It's a very, you know, you're taking care of like, you know, oh yeah, Hippocratic, <laughs> Hippocratic, oh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. That was, was really important. And I would want to do something similar to that with Dyson Spheres, to make sure you're doing this ethically. You want to make sure you're doing this for the good of people, not for, for greed or for money, because it is, you know, it would take in it'd be saving us a lot of money, but it could also, again, conflict. It could cause a lot of conflict. It could cause a lot of, um, I feel like there would be a lot of divide of, for example, people who are in higher class or lower class, middle class, um, maybe people with more energy or less energy. Um, so, but there's really no way for it to be perfect for someone to have more. And there's, because, you know, it's, <laughs> sorry. Um, I had an idea now. I don't know how to explain it. It's really interesting, but we need to make sure we're doing it so that no one has more energy than others. We also don't make sure because if everyone has the same energy, that's also going to be bad. So we need to figure out where it's almost maybe like a currency or just something where it's we're doing it ethically, but we're making sure that it can't cause conflict. Yeah. You know, Benji, uh, last year, uh, Dina actually participated in the Australian um, Space Biology uh, Symposium and got an award for Future Society. Um, uh, it, it's a Future Society Award. She developed a constitution for Mars, for Martian um, uh, inhabitants. 
wow that's super cool uh yeah i can actually send that it's uh it was a really interesting concept actually i a research uh, a researcher ended up um emailing me i have unfortunately already forgotten his name um and it was really interesting and we discussed he was a he's a space lawyer and we discussed how these laws could be implemented and i kind of did this in the form of a constitution where it would be just a set of laws for uh, a future mars colony okay well thank you so much dina and kai this is this was really awesome yeah wait just checking kai do you want to make any um closing statements i feel like i haven't let you talk i'm so sorry <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I think the only, there's something I wanted to add, like, you know, after we, in the future, if we do actually um, create, say, a Dyson, a Dyson Swarm or a Dyson Sphere, and we are able to get, harness all of that energy, I think it's really important that all that power doesn't go into the hands of, like, one country or one organization. I think it really has to be spread up spread out globally uh, and everyone should have a say in what we should do with this energy or a say i think something that would be really interesting to study maybe in the future is something possibly like um energy um related economics um after we have all of this energy and we can use it sort of like a currency like uh, dina mentioned Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you again so much. Yeah.